maybe we can wait another minute. I see that people are still joining. Maybe I can share the screen in the meantime, no? Yes. I sure. think, uh, let me know if, do you see there? Yes, it's not full screen yet. Yeah, yeah. perfect. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to introduce uh, the speaker of today's our seminar, Gonzalo Parra. Uh, Gonzalo trained in bioinformatics at the Universidad Nacional de Entre Rios, Argentina, where he studied candidate genes involved in pluripotency maintenance in embryonic stem cells under the supervision of Dr. Patricio uh, Yankilevich. Gonzalo received his PhD in 2016 from Buenos Aires University, working in the field of structural bioinformatics under the supervision of Professor Diego Ferreiro. After that, he obtained an EMBO long-term postdoctoral fellowship and moved to the Max Planck Institute for Biophysical Chemistry in Göttingen in the group of Dr. Johannes Söding, where Gonzalo changed his research topic, moving to the field of single cell transcriptomics to study cellular differentiation. Currently, is a postdoctoral researcher at the MBL in the group of Dr. Oliver Segel, where his main focus is the study of medulloblastoma using multiomics data, which is also the main topic of his presentation today. I'm very much looking forward to your seminar, Gonzalo, whenever you are ready to start. Thank you. Um, I think I'll take more or less 40, 45 minutes for the talk, um, but just feel free to stop me if I take more. Uh, so thanks everyone for being here. It's, it's really nice to be presenting this in front of all of you. And luckily I cannot be in Barcelona right now, but I hope there will be a future time for this. So the title of my talk, it's Why Tales, uh, Jumping from Structural Bioinformatics to the Multi-Omics Field. And it's called Why Tales because actually White Tales is the title of, a, of a, an Argentinian movie, and I am from Argentina, as in the introduction. I recommend it because it's, it's very nice, it won a lot of prizes, but also because uh, it is about six different stories. They, along the, the, the movie, they seem to be quite disconnected in the beginning, but actually I will not spoil the, the, the movie for you, but there is a conducting story that joins them all. And as the movie, I also had my wild stories that seem a little bit disconnected, at least to me in the beginning of my career and in the present a little bit. So as mentioned, I, I, I started uh, researching a little bit about transcription factors and how they are maybe enriched in certain genes, uh, sets of genes. And in particular, we apply this to try to discover genes that are important for the maintenance of stem cell identity, both in embryonic stem cells and cancer stem cells. But after uh, my, my bachelor master's, uh, I moved to the structural uh, field in bioinformatics for my PhD in Buenos Aires University. Uh, in those years, I studied uh, protein structures, basically. I studied symmetries, I studied repetitions, that are uh, tandemly repeated over certain types of structures. I studied a little bit how protein folding, how protein folding functions, and especially I worked on a topic which is called energetic frustration, which is something I will talk a little bit today, and I'm still working on this. Uh, after my PhD in a very structural uh, driven um, work, I, I moved to Germany to, for my first box doc, here, I wanted to change a little bit. I wanted to actually work in, in proteins, uh, protein sequences, protein domains with Johannes Soding. He, he has a lot of work in that, in that field, but actually he proposed me to change to single cell transcriptomics. And I was working for some years uh, on developing a tool, which is called Merlot, for reconstructing lineage trees, topologies uh, with single cell RNA-seq data, basically trying to understand differentiation processes and dynamic processes. And also I participated in developing a tool which is called PROST, 
which is a tool we used in order to benchmark this tool that is able to generate, simulate single cell RNA-seq data sets. And after this, for all these times, I was working in topics that are kind of very theoretical or very um, computational driven, like developing of tools. And I wanted to maybe, uh, before continuing my career, to do something more applied, more, more, more closer to, to some, some biological problem, to work on a biological problem for a long time. So in my second postdoc, actually in the, in, the, in the group of Oliver Stegler, I'm working in the medulloblastoma disease, which is the second part of the story I will talk today. We are trying to understand this type of cancer in children. And I am putting this because for me it's very important. I am part of the LG Argentina, which is part of the Student Council from ISB. And for me, building community is very important. And this has been across all my years um, since I started my, 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 my career. So the first story in, in this morning is energetic local frustration in proteins. And maybe the main message is that proteins are not optimized to fold, but to function. And this means that when proteins start to fold, as which this is the current uh, view in the field, that we have an energy landscape and proteins just fold while minimizing the energy and they reach the bottom of this funnel here where the native state is. But when folding, not all of the interactions between the residues that compose the, the polypeptide chain are energetically minimized. And actually some conflicts have been kept in place uh, over evolutionary times, or they have even appeared over evolutionary uh, time scales. Um, the native state or the native ensemble, which is a definition I like more, is constituted by several conformers that are in a dynamic equilibrium. And this equilibrium between the different conformers is what gives the proteins their function. And this, this dynamic equilibrium can be, can, and, and movement between different conformers, it's, it's possible because there are certain local instabilities that allow the protein to explore the basin part of this funnel. And this is what we call uh, local frustration or frustrating interactions. So some years ago, we generated a web server that is able to find and, and, and quantify frustration in protein structures. And it's very easy. It's, it's available in this link here. And basically, if you have a protein structure, you can use an energy function and for every pair of interacting residues, you can calculate which is the native energy in this pair of residues. And for this interaction, then you can uh, perform perturbations, uh, either by changing the identities of the residues or by changing the distance uh, of the residues in the, in the structure. And this is going to give you different types of, 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 of ways of mentioning frustration. I will not really go into details, but there are three, configurational, if you move the conformation, mutational, if you move the identities, and single residue if you just change one of the residues at, at the same uh, in, in one time. So we can uh, generate different decoys or conformers or alternative uh, uh, structures. And for every time we perturb, we calculate the distribution of energies for this, these decoys. And then we just compare the native energy con against this distribution. And depending on where in this distribution the native energy falls, we can classify it into being minimally frustrated, neutral, or highly frustrated. So uh, over the years, this is a topic that was started in the group of Peter Walliness by my PhD supervisor when he was a postdoc. And he found that in, when they checked in monomeric structures in the PDV, they found that at around 10% of the interactions that we can find in a protein structure are actually in conflict with its, their uh, local uh, environment. At around 50% of them, they are neutral, and only, uh, I mean, it's not only, but 40% of the interactions are really favorable, favorable uh, in terms of where they are located. Also, they found, and this is a pair distribution function, pair distribution function that measures which is the density of a certain type of molecules around a certain point. And we are, what they are mentioned here is how dense the the, the frustrated interactions are around certain types of sites. And in this case, they found that these this, uh, red interactions or the highly frustrated ones are enriched around binding sites and also around allosteric proteins, which, which means uh, uh, that these sites are, are, have a high concentration of this type of interactions. Um, later on, during my PhD, a part of my PhD, which was the latest part, I got my first uh, student, Maria Freiberger, and as part of her master thesis, 
we studied how frustration is present in protein enzymes. And for this, we took all of the enzymes with known catalytic site, sites from the catalytic site atlas, and those that have uh, structures uh, experimentally solved. And we measured again, which is the, the, the density of these types of interactions around the catalytic sites. Here you can see in yellow the catalytic sites of certain types of enzymes. And it seems that there is, um, maybe you can really see, but believe me, that it seems that there, are, uh, uh, there, there is an enrichment of, 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 of uh, uh, frustrated interactions around these yellow spheres. But here we measure and actually we observe that regardless the type of oligomerization these enzymes can have, and I'm showing here only monomers and homodimers because of space, there is an enrichment about this type of sites. But after this, uh, up, to, up to now, frustration was always measured in groups of unrelated um, proteins. And we wanted to know now for the first time, because it was uh, also a system that we had uh, studied in the laboratory, if protein families, they have conservation of frustration across the members they are composed of. So this is the beta-lactamases protein family, and this is a, it's like a sequence logo, but actually made of frustration. So here, what we are doing, these are the positions in the, in the, in the protein family from the, uh, from the structural alignment. And we, based on the information content, we measured how conserved the energetics is, is in different positions uh, in the protein family. The higher the bar, the higher the conservation and the color, uh, uh, explains which is the, the type of interaction that dominates in this position. We find that certain positions are tall and green, which are uh, positions that are basically in the hydrophobic core of the proteins. But then the, the interesting ones are the ones that are high and red, which are uh, positions that are in conflict, but also they are conserved across families. So there's an energetic conflict which is conserved across the whole family. And they correspond in asterisks to many of the, of the catalytic sites actually. And the ones, some of them, they are in gray, but we can disentangle this value into the specific interactions. And when we observe this on top of a, of a, of a given protein structure, we can see here are the, the catalytic sites of this family and also here in, in, in yellow. And we can observe that they are all part of a network of uh, frustrated interactions. So we started to see that actually even in protein families we can give an explanation of why this is happening, why these conflicts are, are, are maintained. But certain positions actually they don't belong to catalytic sites, they belong to other types of, of residues where we don't really know what they are doing there. So we were thinking that maybe this concept can be actually extended in a more general way. And this is how also I got after another student, Diego Luna, who is studying glo globins. And in this case, we are showing our results in the hemoglobin uh, uh, superfamily. For example, uh, hemoglobin is, is a tetramer composed of two beta chains and two alpha chains. And these beta and alpha, uh, alpha uh, subfamilies, they are evolutionally related. So if we measure frustration in, as we did before, uh, in all the, the alpha and beta uh, globins together, we obtain this logo, sequence logo, and this frustration logo. And if we separate alpha and beta, we observe something very particular, which is, for example, in this position here, it seems that there's either a Q or a K, right? But when we check the alpha and the beta families, we observe that the K actually is present only in the alpha or majoritary in the alpha and is highly frustrated. And beta, the beta subfamily have, has the other alternative and it's actually not highly frustrated. It's more neutral, but actually it's not even conserved at a big extent. So with this, we start to think, is it possible to use frustration as a matter of check over evolutionary scales in the evolution and divergence of protein families that are related to each other? How frustration was appearing over time and how function was gained over time in this evolution? So we continued this work. We added a myoglobin and we are comparing now, this is an ongoing project. Uh, we are comparing the different positions that according to some collaborators are important for the function of globins in general. But also we had the idea of getting resurrected proteins, which are proteins that are reconstructed um, given phylogenetic studies. We can reconstruct the sequences of the ancestors that are, were existing uh, in the past. And we can measure frustration. And we are now trying to put all this information together to understand 
how the patterns in, in this part of the phylogeny appear, but also relating to how do we observe the energetic conflicts in these ancestral points in the phylogeny. So up to here, all of this was done while our frustratometer was a web server. Um, but we were tired of trying to solve problems to people because people were asking us, can I download the software? And the software was not really nice. Actually, it was a pipeline very, very Frankenstein-like. Uh, so this year also we got Attila Rauch, a new student, and his co-supervised by Leandro Radowski. Um, and we just developed the frustratometer into an R package. And with just a few lines of codes, you can calculate frustration patterns in any kind of protein you want. Uh, this is going to be soon in the archive, but the, 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 the first automator package is already uh, available in GitHub. And actually it's pretty simple, with just a few codes, lines of code, you can get the typical pictures that we generate in the web server, but also this gives us more flexibility. So now we included a new function to calculate how frustration changes if we mutate a given residue uh, to all the other residues we can, amino acids we can have. And also we included a new module to study frustration across molecular dynamics simulations. And with these profiles over time, we can cluster residues according to their temporal evolution. Uh, we can generate these kind of graphs in which we can detect modules, and then we can detect residues that have uh, similar behaviors over time. And for example, here we are just showing two examples one type of residue that just increases frustration over time and another one that just decreases frustration, frustration over time. So from this part, uh, the take home message is that there are energetic conflicts in the, that they are not necessarily clashes, they are real energetic conflicts that are present in native states of, of, of proteins that have been evolutionarily kept uh, because of functional restraints they are important for protein motion and in general for several kind of protein uh, functional aspects. These are the functional aspects we have been uh, studying in the group. This is also a new process we are having with one, one student trying to improve docking with using frustration. And also over time, some other people have used this, this a lot. And recently, this is some just cherry picked papers. Uh, for example, it has been used to study the SARS-CoV-2 um, to study dissolved proteins, proteins that fold upon uh, binding, uh, to study mutants that are related to some kind of diseases and so on. So this is the first part. And the second part, maybe the most interesting for also for maybe because it's my current main project is what I'm doing now in my current postdoc, uh, which is trying to understand the medulloblastoma disease with multi-omics data. So uh, first of all, I want to acknowledge all of the people that have been working with, with me in this project, especially Hannah, who uh, is also one of the main uh, workers in this, uh, and other... Hello. Yes. Maybe, maybe it's better if we can take uh, some questions here. So yeah. Is, uh, okay. Sure. <laughs> Too long. Sure. And, and this is a different topic, so maybe it's a, it's a good moment to take a few questions uh, yeah. now. Ladies and gentlemen. I have some questions, if nobody else would like. I um, have a question as well. Okay, please. Go okay. Please. Uh, Gonzalo, thank you for uh, for this first part of the of the presentation. It's really interesting. Now, I was wondering, like this, um, you are describing uh, local energetic uh, conflicts, no? So I was wondering how those local energetic conflicts relate to the overall global energy of the protein, and if you have like a threshold to say this is a real conflict or this is can be like tolerated in the overall yeah. protein. So uh, the first question, the global uh, energy, so if you have a, so you, you have foldable proteins and then you have a whole range of disordered flavors, right? Um, so a foldable protein will have a very funneled energy landscape and then non so foldable proteins that will have different types of landscapes. So this depends on the, on the particular system you're studying. Uh, and then the individual uh, energetics. So when we, generate the, 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 the distribution here, 
Um, this one, this is basically a C score, right? This is standard deviation units. So this threshold here, it's one standard deviation minus one. And this here is 0.78. Uh, for this configuration and mutation on 0.68 for the single residue is based on how is the entropic, the entropy that you need to fold either one or two residues. This is all explained in, in, in the main paper uh, from my PC supervisor and in the supplementary, but it's related to this. I mean, this is just a C-score distribution and then the, the thresholds, uh, one is based on entropy according to folding, protein folding theory, and the other one is just one standard deviation to the negative side. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, so, yes. Uh, so I, I, I think it's very interesting. Uh, I, I missed, uh, how do you define the frustration? Is something related to delta G of interaction between pairs of residues? So yes, so this energy, this energy function, it's uh, actually it's a statistical potential that is trained uh, in, 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 on, on the PDB. So basically there are three types of contacts in first thermometer, uh, short contacts, long contacts and water mediated contacts and so basically we have three matrices that have statistical uh, values of how uh, how much energy do you, do you have between for example an alanine or and a valine uh, in the whole uh, pdv at the yeah. certain so it's okay. a very broad coarse grain potential all right so it's a statistical potential is not a simulation based okay no. And so my question is, how do you interpret this enrichment of frustration in the binding site? I mean, by any chance this could be due to, you know, our way to measure this uh, interaction or, you know, potential interaction? Yeah. Uh, or, um, and then another question is, uh, is this local frustration uh, predictive of binding sites? I mean, did you try to use this feature to try to predict functional sites or binding sites and how that uh, compare with traditional methods for binding site predictions? Okay, so the first question, um, so frustration, maybe I can start with the last one. So, um, I saw related. Uh, so binding sites, they are enriched, we have seen like, it's a kind of a prior, right? It's a circular thing because we, we just got all the, for example, the, 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 the proteins are homodimers, heterodimers, and so on. And we know which are the interfaces. And then we measure around those interfaces, the enrichment, <coughs> that there is an enrichment. The, the, the opposite problem is if you know nothing about your protein and you want to know which is the binding site, that's a bit tricky because frustration, as I have shown, it's, it's related to many functional um, uh, aspects. So actually you don't really have a way to disentangle which kind of function is related to that particular frustrated region. If this region is in the, I don't know, in, in, in the surface of the protein, you can maybe infer that this is our binding site. Something we are doing now with this trying to improve docking. So this work is with effort pocket. We, we calculate pockets in a, in a given protein. And then these pockets, we observe that the energetic of the pockets that are predicted, it's different. So they are good pockets in terms of energy and bad pockets. These bad pockets, which means they have conflicts, usually they correspond to the true uh, binding site when we are talking about small ligands. But then it's not so easy because Again, when you have frustration, you know that there might be some functional restraint there uh, if it's not a clash from the, a defect from the crystal. Uh, but other than that, you need to do some other experiments maybe or analysis. Thank you. Uh, what is the, 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 the follow-up of um... Yeah, one of one, for example, one of the examples. Um, how do you how do you uh, test this uh, experimental? What is the what is the? Uh, well, we how do you test that conflict? Uh, you know, the, 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 the regions, whatever they are binding site. I think they are more interested in the one that they are not binding site. 
how do you uh, really uh, understand what are they doing? What they are doing? Uh, me particularly, I have, uh, that's one of the reasons why also I... Oh, yeah, it's, a, it's a general question, not you in particular, but how will you do it or what is the way of doing it? So, is one paper from the Vendrusculo laboratory in which they linked frustration to aggregation. And actually they did uh, biochemical assays to, to see, I mean, what they observed in different constraints. For example, they can mutate the, the protein and see if then frustration is, really, is, 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 is changed or not. And if it changes its behavior, for example, there are also a lot of, uh, of experiments on protein folding that uh, a lot of, uh, of people have done frustration analysis in specific proteins. Some, many of them, they are quite small because it's easier to study them. And then they do, I don't know, decroidism, they do mutations and they do a lot of, of, of biochemical assays and they just link if frustration is actually pointing at what they predict from the structure or from the dynamics. Um, these are the kind of analysis, uh, the experiments that confirm the frustration findings in my reading, for example, from the biography. Well, this is, uh, this is well, yeah, I see here two different things. One is uh, confirming that this re you know, the region of the species are really frustrated. Uh, that you can, you know, you can mutate them, and see you can uh, recover more uh, stability of folding. That's is a, you know, experimental follow-up to really to check if these regions are really frustrated in the sense of energetically frustrated. Something different is to understand why they are there. You know, that's a more complicated question, I guess, no? Why something that in principle is, uh, uh, you know, anomalous and uh, probably uh, deleterious in terms of um, uh, you know, uh, yeah. folding uh, is there? and uh, how they have survived a long evolutionary time. No? And that's, that's, I guess, is a more complicated question, but you're not asking. Yes, I believe that the results are there. It can be shown experimentally to, to some degree. And uh, I ask, what are they doing? And that's, a, a, you know, uh, uh, I think for the binding side, there's this paper claiming that this is bad because the binding side has to be more unstable, blah, blah, but for the non-binding side, well, there is a nice paper in some kind of birds that uh, they are these birds that are flying super high in the, in the, in the mountains. Uh, mm -hmm. And they have a, a variation in the hemoglobin, so they bind oxygen uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a different way. They're optimized to bind oxygen better or to make better use of oxygen. Um, and they, they, they actually made the, the experiment in which if they mutate that, then you lose this, 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 this uh, advantage. So basically also it has been shown in, in different uh, diseases that certain proteins actually when you delete, when you make a mutation that decreases frustration, then there's a loss of function. And this equilibrium between the different conformers that constitute the, the native state is very delicate. If you just delete certain uh, conflicts, then they, they cannot move in the same way and then function, it's, it's affected. It's, 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 it's very difficult to, to just make a hypothesis from when you find the frustration there to see why uh, this is important, but it has been shown in many examples. Okay. So, but uh, I have another question. Um, so, one one curiosity because uh, what what Alfonso was saying, I think, for the frustration of binding sites, so probably the hypothesis or the advantage of having such frustration is that uh, the binding sites, if they are frustrated, I expect there is also some rigidity of the side chains. And this will reduce the entropic cost of binding the ligand. So that that has a big advantage uh, for the for the binding. But um, is it true that local local frustration also correlate with other physical chemical properties like uh, you know rigidity or uh, of the side chains, uh, for example, during some molecular dynamic simulation? Okay, this is interesting. We 
During my PhD, I tried to correlate frustration with many things. Sasa, different types of, of energetics, uh, many, 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 hydrophobicity, um, different, different measures. Um, so I didn't see something that really correlates all of the time. And sorry, what was the, sec the second part of your question? Yes, if, if that is true, that for example, it, it, I mean, if the hypothesis is that frustration is a, it's providing some entropic advantage binding sites, then you would expect to see higher or lower flexibilities of those side chains of those sites in, in molecular dynamics, for example. Uh, respect to the side chains, uh, this is a coarse grain potential. Um, so it only sees the backbone of the protein, actually. Uh, it doesn't get an energetic description of the side change or the atoms that constitute the side change. But now it, 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 it is an ongoing project in Peter Warner's group uh, in which they are applying a new function based on the Rosetta potential so they can get um, energetics at the side chains, uh, so full, full atom um, uh, potential. But this is yet not released for the public use. Um, I don't even have it. Um, so but I know it's, it's, it's been implemented and developed, but it, it's not so easy because it's a lot of theory, protein folding theory to make it work properly. So that's why they're taking a lot of time to, to get it done properly. Mm -hmm. But it, it will be possible. So far, it is only a coarse grain description of the C alphas in the mm -hmm. backbone. Okay. Yeah. I see. Okay, uh, so there is one question from Rock. I think you have to unmute yourself. I was sorry. Uh, hi, Gonzalo. Thanks for your talk so far. Um, so uh, a bit of context. Uh, I study point mutations in cancer. So and what we do is comparing the wild type epitope or the, the wild type version versus the mutated one. So my question was, um, do you think uh, single amino acid changes can cause relevant frustrations? And this also can be functional by, for the tumoral cells? Um... I, I do think it can be. Um, actually, uh, a tedious project is actually, it was never supposed to do an R package. It's actually, we try, so there's a, a, a big data set that Leandro has um, from his collaborators in which there's a lot of thousands of mutants, like 10,000 mutations that are related to diseases. And actually uh, we want to, uh, the, the, the part that we try to get started actually is about of mutations in, in, in related to diseases, many of them in cancer, but we haven't done it yet. There is um, a paper, uh, maybe you want to read it. It's this one here. It was um, some years ago. It actually tackles this somehow. Okay. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll check it. Thanks. Yeah, I, I can send you the reference if you, if you want later. Thanks. Maybe we can go ahead with your presentation. OK, uh, just let me know if I know how to stop, uh, I think. So uh, the second part of this, of, of this talk, it's trying to understand medulloblastoma disease with multi-omics data. So yeah, these are the people that were working in this project so far. And medulloblastoma. Medulloblastoma is a type of brain cancer that affects children that in between these, 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 these ages. Um, it's very aggressive. There are different types of it based on their genetic signatures. Uh, and some patients, they really have a bad prognosis when they get this uh, disease diagnosed. And we are studying the, the most aggressive subtype, which is the, the one that has a germline TP53 mutation, or it's also called Lee-Fromeni syndrome or LFS. And particularly for this type of, of, of medulloblastoma, uh, the patients, they exceptionally have a five years survival after the initial diagnosis. So um, we have different samples for this project. Um, we have a primary patient that had a, a, a primary tumor, then it got treated, then it got a relapse, and then got metastasis and passed away. But we have samples from these two states. And also we have an animal model for this. So it's called a PDX model of patient-derived xenograft. So basically, 
uh, they can take cells from the patient and inoculate them in the mice. And the mice, they just re recreate the environment and, rec and they, they develop the tumors. And after some time, you, you can collect the cells and, and get them processed and get the data. So this, because it's, it's, it's biopsious, uh, we have single, single nuclei data uh, because they come from frozen tissue. And from this, because it's fresh tissue, we have single cell RNA-seq data. Um, for this patient, we have then four samples. Uh, one for the primary, both for the human tissue and, and the PDX model, and one for the relapse also for the human tissue and for the PDX model. And then we got also four other samples that are all primary tumors. For some of them, we have PDX data, and for some of them, we have nuclei because sometimes the, the samples just didn't work at the end. Um, and the type of data we have, we have tissue level data, so bulk DNA seq CMV, this is copy number variation data. We have um, copy number variation data at the single cell level. We have single cell and single nuclei RNA seq data. And also we have a small uh, amount of cells in which we measure simultaneously um, data from the genome and, from the, and, and the transcriptome at the same time from the same cell. So I will talk a little bit about the part of the single cell DNA CMV from the 10X uh, platform. So basically, I have to now um, introduce a concept which is called chromatripsis, which happens in certain types of, of types of cancer. Uh, it's a, a form of, of genome instability. It's, it's a, a different view of the step-by-step -step evolution of a tumor. It actually postulates that there is a single early catastrophic event that happens at the germline, and then it, it, it just uh, is transmitted. Uh, in, the, in the evolution of the tumor. So basically what happens is that the, the chromosomes, if they are fully deployed, they get shattered, all, all, all shattered, and then the cell tries to desperately put it all together back, uh, but it doesn't do it in a very uh, good way. So some pieces are lost, some pieces are independently circularized and amplified. This is called double minute chromosomes. And then the ones that are able to be reassembled they are reassembled maybe with reversions or in a non very uh, order way. So they, they, they have transpositions and so on. So then when you compare, this is a normal uh, profile, which is all diploid. And then you have the chromatriptic profile in which you have regions that are diploid, regions that are amplified or regions that are depleted. And the thing is that these cells, after a few cycles, after the, 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 the embryo starts to develop, some genes, for example, tumor suppressor genes are disrupted or oncogenes are amplified, then there is an advantage, a selection advantage for these cells. So eventually then the, the tumor develops. And chromatripsis it has been uh, linked to the aggressivity of, of different types of tumors and also it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an indication of poor prognosis for the patients. So we try to understand if this is uh, related to these medulloblastoma uh, patients. Um, so basically, our collaborators from the experimental side, they generated the bulk data. So this is showing one of the samples. So as you see, there's a, a big amount of the, of the genome. These are different chromosomes that are diploid. And then some regions are amplified and some regions are deleted. And we have the, kind, the same uh, type of, 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 of sample. We, we have single cell data, and here again, the, the things in white are deployed, the, things, the, the regions in, in blue are depleted, and the ones in red are amplified. So we want to know with this, if can we apply chromatripsis at the single cell level? Um, can we make inference of which was the early event that gave rise to the chromatripsis? Where in the genome happened, and if it was a single event or if it was a combination of events altogether. And if it was more than one event, did it happen altogether or did it happen in steps? And then we have a different, uh, different clones in our tumor. All these questions we want to address. So here is just an amplification of chromosome seven, which is in our case, the chromosome that shows the highest degree of chromatripsis. And basically you see that there are different states and the it is one region of the chromosome. It's just the 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 the, the, the ploidy just goes up and down, up and down, up and down many times, and 
uh, we can apply a tool to detect chromatrypsis at the bulk level. There is a tool called ShutterSeq that was recently um, published. And when we apply this to this sample, we observe chromatrypsis at these chromosomes here. Um, and the, the, unfortunately, there's no chromatryptic detector, detector at the single cell level, so we try to do one ourselves. So our criteria to detect chromatrypsis is very, very simple. Is we given a 50 megabases window, we just uh, ask for this window to have at least 10 switches between different uh, CMV states. So this goes on ups and downs, they need to be at least, at least 10 in a given window. So this is one particular single cell, uh, and this is chromosome seven. So you can see that there are different switches. So basically we put um, a window and we count how many changes do we have. If they are more or equal to 10, then this window is considered to be chromatriptic. Then we slide this window all over the chromosome and we count, we make a score basically, how many uh, windows are positive for chromatripsis over the total amount of windows that we checked. And this is our very simple score for detect chromatripsis. Um, the thing is that actually it doesn't really work very well. So at a certain extent here, you can see the score is the color. Um, these are the chromosomes and here you have the cells and this is how it compares to the bulk data that I was showing before. So you can observe some signal in chromosomes four, five, seven, uh, some 16 in X, if you look it with a lot of love, but also there's a lot of noise all over the place. So, and the color actually, it, it doesn't mean that this, uh, this is re more, more confident than this one. It just means that the region that is affected by chromatripsis can be smaller because this is a, just a normalized score of how many windows we have. So we observe that at a certain extent, we recapitulate some of the chromosomes that are detected as chromatriptic in the bulk data, but this doesn't really give us much newer information. So we want to know if we can uh, do something about it. So after a while, uh, I said, why don't we just um, aggregate all this data in a kind of pseudo bulk profile to compare to the, to the bulk data? We did so. So this is a pseudo bulk profile. And then we observe, at least visually, there is a resemblance, a very nice resemblance between the chromatriptic chromosomes. We observe that there is something going on here. They're not completely flat. So the, the, the question we start to make is, can we partially aggregate cells in a meaningful way so we get somewhere in the middle between single cells and the full bulk uh, aggregation? So for this, we started to uh, apply an algorithm that was developed by Hannah Susak, which is a post, she's a postdoc in our group. So uh, given the heat map from the single cells that we have from the 10X uh, platform, she calculates um, pairwise distances between different cells. So we apply the evolution edit distance. So edit distance is how many changes do I need to apply uh, to convert one vector of characters into another? And we call it evolutionary because uh, we can have uh, events like holding, whole genome duplications that are counted as one change, for example. Or if you have a long string of, of numbers that change, it's not, let's suppose we have 20 segments that have the same value. These are not 20 changes, it's only one because it's just the whole segment changing together. So based on these distances, we can create a graph. This graph actually here has the normal cells and then the different colors are the ploides that are calculated by the 10X platform. And then we can cluster these three uh, somehow. And we applied a very simple clustering algorithm to cluster this into 20 uh, communities and it's very arbitrary. We just chose 20 and then I will show uh, how we can improve this. But it's just to start to see if we can aggregate these uh, profiles from these communities to detect better the chromatripsis. So, this is the heat map that is now clustered by these 20 communities and these are the pseudo bulk profiles from the different uh, communities. And here, for example, you have the, 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 the normal cells that are quite flat, these, are, these cells here. And then, for example, also it's interesting to see that even at this level, we can observe that there are certain communities or clones, if we momentaneously can think about them as this. Like, for example, there is a change, there's a difference here. So, for example, this, clones here, they have a full chromatriptic seven, chromosome seven, and then these ones here don't have this part as chromatriptic. So the question is, this is happening before, and this is a later event. So we, we are going to that question now. So we applied our chromatriptic score now on the bulk profile, 
We also do it on the pseudo bike profile and we do it also on the pseudo bike profiles from the different 20 communities. And we observe that now there's not so much noise anymore. Um, there are some communities that have differences, for example, this one here and this one's here. This is normal cells again. Um, so we were a little bit happy with this. And now we want to relate this to how the events ap uh, appeared on, 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 the, on the whole tree. But for this, we need to now go to the question of how do we improve the clustering? So we think that 20 clusters is just too much. We don't really believe that there are 20 clones. So can we improve this clustering? Can we uh, calculate statistical differences between these communities that we have right now and define uh, more confident clones? How can we compare these communities? And what do we compare between them? It's also something we had to think about. And if we do this, which are the important events? And again, do they happen to, to appear independently or in groups? So in order to do this, we, we, here we have our communities again, and we created something we call metacells. So basically, given the, the, the cells that are present in one group, we ask, which is the most prevalent value in a given genomic uh, coordinate? And then we choose this value as being the value that is going to be representative of the whole group in this meta cell. So basically, it's a democratic profile, fully democratic profile. And then we compare differences between the different communities here, the, these meta cells. And here we have, this is a simplified the description of the tree, of the 20 communities, how they are uh, related to each other in the tree. And we can have different paths here. For example, we have this one that goes from eight to nine, or we have this one that goes from eight to two. And we can calculate now which are the differences in the different pathways in the tree. So many of these pathways, these are all the, po the possible pathways here. Many of them, they share a big extent of the path because all this is shared to many of these pathways here. And something that it was nice to see is that the difference, actually, these are the communities and these are the difference, right? How many segments are different in this? So most of the changes that occur when we go from this to this. So we go start in the normal cells and we go to this clone here and here is where most of the changes are concentrated. And it happens all together at the same time. So this question of are most of events happening all together? The answer so far is yes. Um, and then there's only one pathway, which is actually this one that shows a second way of changes in this part. And actually what happens here, there is a, a an increase, an increase in employee. We think that there is a whole genome duplication happening here. Um, but so far, we also don't know if these changes are significant or not, because this is pretty clear. But then, is this change significant? Is this significant? We don't really know. And I didn't say each of these lines is a chromosome. Uh, so we try to improve this. And in order to do this, we performed a permutation test. So basically, uh, given two communities, we can calculate if the meta cell differences are significant or not between two groups. So first, we calculate the differences between the two real meta cells that we had before. Then we take the two groups and we just shuffle the labels of the cells to which of the two groups they belong. And we create a new pair of meta cells. And then we measure again how many differences do we have. And then we repeat many times. So the idea, and for example, this is one of the paths is that if these differences are real, then when we do the permutations, the differences are going to be lower because if the differences are real, we can have random differences when we shuffle. So these are just two examples. So the, these are random differences because we have 7% of the times that we reshuffle the labels, we have more differences than in the real case. And in this case, for example, differences are real because from the thousand permutations we do, there's none of the permutations have more uh, differences than the real ones. And then we can just set up a, a threshold for this proportion. We can put it in 1%, for example, and then we decide that we are going to merge certain of these committees. We make a all against all permutation test here. So these were the 20 committees we have. And this is just to show the, 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 how the, 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 the results look. So for example, if we get this portion, these are in, uh, ordered in a decreased way. So this is the more uh, non-significant uh, comparison. So if we get what is here, we observe that we can merge all these communities here. But we, if we do this with a 1% threshold, we get only five communities that are the ones that are depicted here. 
and these are the communities that were merged into these clusters. So if we not now get this and we recluster our data and we calculate the new meta cells, we can now observe that here we have, for example, the normal cells. I mean, I reordered the communities here compared to here. So here we have the normal cells. Then we have all the main events happening at the same time in the first clone. Um, but then there are certain differences. For example, here we don't have chromatrypsis and then it appears here. And then there are some further small um, events happening there. So after this part, uh, now we have the transcriptional data. So as I mentioned before in the introduction, there are eight samples in our, in our study. So these are the main sample, the main patient, the primary tumor and the relapse, both of the human tissue and the PDX. And then these are the four um, other patients, primary tumors. So uh, this is a multi-dimensional uh, problem because there are different technologies and different time points and different patients. Um, and what we want to know is how the transcriptional signatures relate to each other. Where are these events? We want to make a link to what I explained before. So we performed uh, integration using Sura for the eight samples um, using the CCA plus anchors method. And this is a full integration. We made, uh, we try to understand which kind of cell types we have here. So the, it's kind of difficult. So for the normal tissue, we have neuronal immune endothelial cells, but then for the rest, we assign these kind of keywords based on marker genes and on gene ontology enrichment terms. And given this and our experimental uh, collaborators, they said, what if what we are having here is that we have a progressively more tumorigenic cells in this direction here, in, in, in component one. And this is just to show you how the different samples are distributed across the, the, this, this fully integrated map. So first of all, it seems to be that there's not a full, full integration, which is good because some clusters are only present in, in some of the samples. For example, cluster one is absent here, uh, most of it. Uh, but we think that we are having a risk of over-alignment and this is something that happens a lot with Sura. So there are certain solutions for this in the bibliography. One solution can be Stakas, which is a very recent uh, paper that was recently published um, that assumes that not all of the populations are shared between the, the samples and then given the anchors that Sura gives you, it just says, okay, from all these anchors, these ones are not supposed to be taken into account because of the composition of near neighbors across data sets. Uh, we are applying this. We don't have conclusive results yet. And this is a new, also very new tool that appeared from the ties group that we haven't tried, but is in our list to, of, to do this. Um, so the question is, is this real or not? There's a problem of alignment, but also there's a problem of what if this dimension can be only be explained by CMV um, differences, what I explained before. So in order to do this, to see if this trajectory is real, uh, we applied RNA velocity, which is a tool for those that are not familiar with it, that tries to predict which is a transcriptional state of cells in the future uh, based on the ratio of intronic and exonic reads from the technology. And this works well for single cell data sets. For single nuclei, it mostly shows that it doesn't really work or there's no conclusive results for single nuclei data. So when we apply to our single cell RNA-seq data, we observe that there is a direction of dynamic differentiation as it's compatible with our idea. We draw this before applying RNA velocity. And as expected, it doesn't really give us much information if we apply this to the single nuclei subset of the cells. Um, so again, can it be only explained by CMV profiles? Um, these two levels of information, they are not linked because they come from different sets of cells, either when they come from the same samples. But we applied a tool that is called infer CMV that you get a, a, a reference set of cells, for example, a neuronal cluster and say they are your uh, normal cells. And then it computes somehow this given of the transcription uh, profiles from the cells, the CMV profiles in, in, in the data. So 
so far we got kind of nice results. So they are comparable to what we observe bike profiles. And what we did is to take these profiles now that we got from here and we regressed out the signal from, this is one sample, and we regressed out the information for the genes that are in these uh, regions in the genome that are affected by uh, CMVs that are not deployed. And we observed that the morphology, morphology changes, but the relative position of the clusters is maintained the same. So we don't think that actually CMVs are driving the morphology of these plots. And just to be sure, we just filter out the genes completely and the, the, the answer is more or less the same. And then this is just a recluster of the data. Um, so up to now... Uh, sorry to interrupt. I think you have five minutes left. I'm almost finished. No, we, we interrupted by the lot, so then uh, okay. more minutes. Huh? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm just finishing two or three more slides. So basically, up to now, we have tried to understand this disease from two different types of levels. So this is not really multi-omics. We can call it this joint omics, um, in which we have our single cell DNA CMV data. We have uh, defined clones, or at least communities that we think they are clones. We have a tree, and we have uh, seen that there are some kind of events that we were able to spot on the, on the tree. We have our single cell RNA-seq data, our trajectory, that is an hypothesis that we still didn't confirm. Also, we are doing some experiments to see if this is real or not. But this is disjoint. But recently, we have Anna Metzger, and actually I didn't have time to put, I include a, a picture of hers. Um, and, but she started some weeks ago, and she's working on our GNT data. Actually, this data comes from the same sample, the same patient. And this is a set of uh, some kind of uh, 100 uh, cells. So if she can be able to process these two levels from the same cells together and link these events that we observed before, we can just indirectly link these two levels as well because it's the same sample. So in summary, we were able, I think this is a little bit repetitive, so I will go fast. So we were able to recapitulate the major rearrangements in our data. We have a tree that tries to explain the evolution of a tumor. We have a single cell or pseudo bulk for communities detected for chromatripsis. This is something I didn't talk about, but we are trying to understand if some genomic regions, they are linked to each other in different chromosomes, for example, related to oncogenes or so on. And then we have all our single cell data that we are trying to link. So to really finish, um, because this was like trying to show that I changed topics and I think uh, I was interested to show this because this is a very thing that, that haunts me at night. If, will I be able to join these two realities in the future? Uh, so I changed my topic uh, quite a few times. Um, in every step, I was able to acquire a different toolbox uh, to solve different problems. Um, I think this gave me a broader understanding of molecular biology, and at least from the computational part. And I'd like to, I, I think I will be able to apply this in the future when it just comes all together, collapsing in, in a project or in a, in, a, in a set of projects. And actually, recently, this paper appeared in which uh, Alfonso and many others from Europe are, are involved. Actually, Oliver is also here, um, which is a lifetime project, which is a, a pan-European project that tries to apply all of these technologies um, to, to, to detect diseases from before the phenotype is already too severe. And I think people that have a broader uh, view of, of molecular biology or that they have worked in different levels, they also have a nice role to play in these kind of projects in the future. So just to finish, to thank my hosting institutions, my supervisor, Oliver Stegel, the whole Stegel group, um, you, of course, for attending, and this is just a picture of Heidelberg for those of you that didn't meet it yet. You are very welcome when well, well, it's possible to visit, and if you do so, please contact me so we can just get in touch. And um, thanks for your attention, and if you have more questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you very Thank you. much. Questions? I think Davide is talking, but I can Davide. Yeah. Okay. So the first question is is very like general and philosophical, like 
why medulloblastoma? I mean, this approach can be applied to to many other cancers, also adult cancers, and maybe like make your life easier also mm. in terms of uh, you know uh, sample size. And I mean, this is a rare disease, and so all these kind of uh, issues. So I was curious to know why uh, this. And uh, and then the second question is about the tree based approach uh, that you show. Um, so. I got that, that the goal of the approach is to, you know, kind of denoising the data in order to infer the evolution of the tumor. And, uh, but, but then I was wondering also if this approach can be somehow used to inform you about some, uh, I don't know, chromosomic regions that are more fragile than others and that can uh, like generate the, the, the chromotriptic profile that you are observing. Yeah, so why medulloblastoma? Um, I think it's because, uh, I, I think, uh, I'm, I cannot talk uh, in, in place of Oliver, but I think the approach actually the group uh, follows is we pair with experimental groups that are really experts in the topic. And actually Aureli Ernst, she has a laboratory, she's a young researcher here in Heidelberg, and she knows a lot about chromatriptics. She has studied chromatriptics and this kind of uh, things for a long time. Uh, with also in pairing with other uh, experimental groups here. So that's why medulloblastoma is because we have them that they really do understand and they can perform the experiments and so on, um, which is super exciting for me. Yeah. And for the tree approach, uh, yes, I mean, th the problem with the single cell level is that uh, our CV calls, they they don't have the, the power of the bulk um, technology in which we can uh, measure the structural variance across the genome. So we can also not so easily measure which parts are reverted or, or, or just, so we, we know that this region has undergone certain modification. Mm -hmm. So to my knowledge, I don't know if we can answer this from single cell data, at least the kind of data we have, but we can infer some hints from the bulk profiles. I see. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Other questions? Just very technical. So, um, so what what is happening in, in, in single cell is, is very noisy in general. So in many cases, for example, you have that many genes, uh, they just have zero counts in many different cells. Uh, so this affects, of course, the analysis of uh, RNA-seq single cell RNA seq and uh, was wondering how do you uh, solve this? How do you treat those cases for your for your study? Yeah, uh, this is a real problem because actually this is why we want to integrate the data because actually if we could have super huge amount of cells drop out problem or the non measuring of the of of the expression can be solved by having tons and tons of cells. In our case, because it's a tumor tissue, our amount of cells is very limited and we cannot really get more. So this is what we have and there's no more. Um, so that's why we want to integrate because if we can meaningfully integrate, then if you have a shared lower dimensional embedding of the cells, whatever you don't catch in one cell, you have more probabilities of catching it in another because then if you have all of these cells together, then there are quite a few. So in, in, in my opinion, the way we, 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 we apply to overcome this problem is by integration. Um, we are thinking actually now to apply certain types of, of, of uh, imputation uh, techniques, but imputation, the reviews that are out there, they are very cumbersome about uh, how easy it's to apply meaningfully imputation methods and not have art, more artifacts than the ones that you have. And on the other side, we are trying now because we have the bike data. So we are trying to see if we can apply some kind of uh, convolution techniques in order to support our single cell data with the bike profiles altogether because the bike uh, signal is higher. Thanks. And uh, very stupid question. Uh, is it possible to, to increase uh, the 
you know, uh, robustness or gain some further information if you also integrate RNA-seq data? I think I don't understand the question. I so, think... so what you get from this single cell is genomic data, right? This is the sequence of the genome, but are you also using the information from the expression? So, yeah, so this is what, so we have these two levels uh, disconnected uh, now. Um, and for the expression, you can get uh, the same kind of data. And since this is the same sample, we observe that at least visually these profiles are similar, but you never know because again, this is not the same cell. And the way to overcome this is the last part I just explained. We have this small population of cells for which we measure simultaneously um, the level, the same kind of information, but in the same population of cells. So we are aiming that Anna, she's uh, doing an internship now for three months, and that she will be able to get this link from this small data set, or at least advance it at a certain point. And then we can make, if we observe some kind of signal here, we can go and check it here and here separately. And if, the, if, gets, uh, if we find the same signal again in the disjoint data sets, then we can maybe make these links. But so far, it's very difficult for us. Thanks. Other questions? Curiosity. You mentioned relapse. Uh, I was wondering whether those children are under the same uh, uh, treatment. I mean, they are undergoing uh, like the same chemotherapy or maybe others uh, surgery. Like, can how this can affect like your uh, the, the 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 insights that you are getting from uh, from your results? Yeah. Um, the answer is yes. There might be differences uh, because this also this integration here has a huge assumption is that all these tumors, they behave the same way. Um, many chromatriptic, uh, many papers in chromatripsis, they, they show that chromatripsis follows kind of a pathway or an order of events, but we don't know. And so we have also different kinds of integration. So um, this is a, this all samples are from the same patient, for example. Mm. And we have also the same kind of analysis only immersion this uh, but we wanted to, to merge all together to also overcome a little bit the, the, the dropout problem. And actually, if you think about it, this also has a problem because this is human data and this is PDX. We're also not even sure that the mice, they are able to recreate the same type of tumor. They might be very similar, but we don't know at which extent. This is also a question that we have. But again, we are playing with small numbers of cells, different technologies, different time points. So. It's, it's, it, we have been with this for a really, really long time. <laughs> okay, thank you. No Hi, Gonzalo. Uh, fantastic talk. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask you if you could expand a bit in how did you select the starting number of, of communities when in this agglomerative approach? If it's more like a because uh, you commented that it was more like a in sort of way random selection of so yeah. I, I wanted to know how in some way if you pick more uh, more starting communities if it would affect your analysis that analysis a lot or mm -hmm. so we applied different types of clustering uh, techniques um, actually we were not really happy with any of them um, we applied Leiden Louvain many a lot of them ahana is, is is working on this a lot um so we also applied like if you do it automatic it, they give you a certain amount of, of clusters um but then you also can force them to have the number of clusters that you want so basically we tried different numbers and again because we are grouped with a group that really knows the system we concluded that 20 was maybe too much but it was better to have more than just too few. And then eventually farther down in the analysis, you can just merge the ones that are too similar. So that was, so, so 20, so basically 
I have five, five uh, final clones. If I start with 20 or 25, after the permutation collapse, um, I will not have exactly the same clusters, but pretty similar to each other. So this is maybe a, a, an approach, a, a control we need to apply. Like if we start with 20, 25, 30, 40 clusters and we collapse by permutation test, do we have cohesive groups or not? This is actually a nice experiment to do. Thanks for your question. Probably we have to leave it here because it's getting, it's getting late. And, uh, but if there are some more uh, questions, we can take one. I can I can ask you one, one a more general one. No? I think it's uh, like with the, with the, some of the previous ones. So um, how this is going to you know, how do you see? I, mean, I know it's not directly your work, but how do you see this uh, uh, being applied to to the clinic? So uh, we are in the pro in the process of of, of writing the paper actually. Um, so they have made a lot of, of experiments, uh, given the analysis we have made. This is a very iterative work with the wet lab. So we have found, and this is why also I didn't name any gene in particular, but we have found genes that are either in these chromatetic regions and they appear all over the place. Some of them, they are very known. and Some of them, they have not been described. And in the wet lab, they are applying CRISPR, for example, to knock, out, knock, knock down these genes and to see if we, given healthy cells, for example, if we can recreate the chromatriptic um, phenotype experimentally, or at least if we can induce, we know, they can induce the appearance of double minus chromosomes, which are these independent circularized um, uh, chromosomes, uh, which are also an indication of chromatripsis, an indirect indication of chromatripsis. They have done so, and actually some weeks ago, we have really nice results from the laboratory in which they, they show that if they knock down these genes, we get this, this, this phenotype. So basically, we are trying to see if, if we, because we are also trying to, to catch genes that are, uh, can be targeted, right, with some kind of therapy. Um, so we are, we are trying to see if we can find oh, genes. No, that's, 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 that's very good, thank you. I was more thinking the, the full single cell type of approaches, because I'm now, and it's very nice is when you get to this, this data, you can do the analysis. Uh, how will this type of single cell technology uh, be applied in the, clean, in the clinic? That was my, my, what I was thinking. Uh, well, I get if, okay, so. Does it make sense at all or not? I mean, you may say, does it make I sense? I think if, if, we, if we are able to collect a library of genes, for example, or modifications, genomic or transcriptional modifications that we know are um, a fingerprint of a certain phenotypic uh, uh, disease. Um, we can make, a, like, for example, what they do with uh, 23andMe, for example, that they have this panel of things to check. And if you go and check these this signatures in the genome, then you can check, for example, if there is an existence of certain signatures uh, based on our studies in a, in a patient that comes with a certain medulloblastoma tumor, for example, and then we can recommend uh, in the future certain therapies. I, I think, for example, I don't know, I think it's, it's, it's analogous to what it has been applied now with SARS-CoV-2, in which they just found that there are certain Neanderthal variants that are the major risk in terms of genetics to have a severe um, uh, progression of the disease. I think it's kind of a approaches can be applied, but I'm not very sure, actually. Yep. Okay, yeah, we can talk about that. Uh, Alba? You should close it. Yeah, thanks a lot. I think uh, if there is no further questions, we can have a uh, our separate discussions, we can continue this later. Uh, 
Well, thank you very much again for your nice presentation. Thanks everybody uh, for attending. Thank you. Bye.